हेलो एवरी वन सो आई एम आई एम कॉस्त एंड आई एम गोइंग टू बी स्पीकिंग अबाउट सेल्फ होस्टिंग दिस इज गोइंग टू बी अ टू पार्ट टॉक इन द फर्स्ट पार्ट आई एम गोइंग टू बी टॉकिंग अबाउट वाई यू शूड सेल्फ होस्ट सो दिस इज टारगेटेड एट पीपल हु आर न्यू टू सेल्फ होस्टिंग इफ यू आर हेजिटेंट टू स्टार्ट विथ इट और मे बी इफ यू जस्ट स्टार्ट विथ इट एंड देन द अदर पार्ट इज गोइंग टू बी अबाउट टूल्स दैट मेक योर लाइफ ईजी अर वेन यू आर सेल्फ होस्टिंग Uh, so these are tools that i personally found to be very helpful and if you are going to start with self hosting now uh, these three four tools are going to be all that you need to get started with deploying most of your applications uh, so a, a little bit about me uh, i'll i'll not take much time here and we'll come back to it later if you have time uh, so i'm a software developer at vpl academy Uh, i've recently uh, been a lot into programming languages uh, i've been hacking on haskell and ocaml and i recently started contributing to the multi core ocaml project and i hope i'll be able to make some meaningful contribution soon uh, so uh, the talk outcomes like i mentioned so if you are new to self hosting uh, i'll try to convince you why you should start and then uh, yeah the tools that we see will be good enough for you to actually start with self hosting now uh, something that we won't be covering in this talk is uh, how to set up your own self hosting instance at home so self hosting refers to two things one can be when you actually have your own hardware at home and you set up the network and uh, and expose it to the internet maybe you secure it through something like vpn but uh, and then the other way is to rent some server through a cloud provider such as digital ocean aws gcp uh so this talk will have points that uh, work for hosting software that are applicable to both uh, but it won't go into any specific detail about uh, uh, anything any hardware specific thing in particular so uh, uh let's start with why should you self host so when is that uh, obviously it gives you much more privacy and data control if you are a normal human being you are much less likely to be targeted with a Uh, with a hack, and you know where your data stays. So, uh, companies like Google are not making use of your data to uh, uh, to generate revenue for them uh, with ads. And then savings. So this is interesting because if you have a single five dollar cloud instance, you can host your mail server there. You can host your uh, VPN there, and if you have your own apps. if you host your own other apps you can also host your database there uh, and if you uh, if you choose managed services for all three these will easily add up to twice or thrice the same amount uh, and then uh, obviously you have hackability so because you are hosting your own code you can customize it as much as you want uh, granted this uh, might take some uh, might take some diving into the code but It, it, it yeah it's a plus point and then quick deployment so uh, this is very interesting because uh, i've been using my uh, self hosted instance for quick deployments and it's been very handy so uh, i just uh, i just uh, created a discord bot on the weekend and i was able to host it very quickly just some rsync scripts uh, we'll talk about rsync later uh, just some script to move the files from here to there setting up some configuration and then it's deployed it didn't even take me uh, uh 15 20 minutes uh to do that and the same goes for hosting uh, static sites you can very quickly set up scripts to uh, get that deployed and then uh if you are a tech student uh self hosting will really help you in your career so when you self host and i'm talking about self hosting on a linux machine which will usually always be the case what you learn are widely transferable skills so when, if you go on to learn docker kubernetes they all use linux they all use the same linux fundamentals and the issues that you'll encounter while self hosting you'll likely encounter similar issues later on in your career and then the other thing is hosting hackathon projects uh, so if you if you have your deployments figured out you have one less thing to worry about uh same thing if you start up and you want something uh, and you want to host your project somewhere uh, you'll already know how to get that done uh, and 
Yeah, so, uh, and also you can host learning projects there. So with managed hosting providers such as Heroku, Fly.io, you can usually only host HTTP services. Uh, and so if you are hacking on something else, it, it becomes a bit of a limitation. And you can just have fun with it. You can host uh, Discord Telegram bots, servers for multiplayer games, uh, so just websites you hack around with. Uh, yeah, it's just a, a lot of fun. OK, now let's get to the tools that make your life easy. And these are going to be my recommendations also and tools that I found to be very helpful. Would you mind just zooming in a little bit? Oh, yeah, it's sorry. absolutely impossible to read from here. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for pointing it out. A little more if you could. Is this good? Yeah, much better. Thanks for pointing it out. So, <clears throat> um, so these are my personal recommendations. And also, uh, th some of these are slightly modern tools, and some of these are very old tools that maybe you might not uh, have heard about. So OK, let's start with Caddy. So Caddy is a web server. So for people who might be new to self-hosting, uh, a web server is a, a, a web server is the software that will listen on your port 80 or 443. So port 80 is your HTTP, port 443 is your HTTPS. So your web server will listen there, and depending on the domain name, it will uh, do different things with it. It will maybe serve from a, a server file from a directory, or it will transfer that request to another application that is running on your machine. So those are the two popular ways uh, of using a web server. And the plus point of Caddy is that the configuration is very easy. And uh, when I say this, that is in comparison to the other web serving web, web server configurations uh, that exist out there. And uh, and by very good defaults, I mean that it also takes care of SSL by default. So this is an example configuration of a uh, of a caddy file. This is this is I think exactly what I use for my own. Uh, my own personal website. So this is the domain name, costup.page. And because I want to serve static files from, from it, I say file server, very straightforward. I say the, uh, I, I give the path to the directory root. Star is the match all for the request path. So this is the URL. And for any request, I want to serve files from this directory. OK, this is straightforward. And then, uh, when I have a dynamic website, I can very simply say reverse proxy to port 8000. A reverse proxy is the second situation that I mentioned. When you want to transfer your request from your web browser, some from your web server to another application on your machine, uh, that's called a reverse proxy. Now, if you were trying to do the same thing in one of the status quo uh, web servers, nginx or Apache. Uh, one thing is that, uh, so for example, in Nginx, you don't say reverse proxy. You say proxy pass, and then you have to also configure all of the, uh, all of the uh, servers and all of the headers that need to be passed because you're proxying it to the. Uh, and then the other thing is you also have to set up SSL certificates manually. And if you're doing it with Let's Encrypt, which is uh, let's encrypt and search bot, which is the popular way to do it. You'll also have to set up a cron job to keep renewing it. So Caddy takes care of all of it by default, and so you don't have to worry about. It. So what happens is all of your uh, all of your website configurations become really simple, two or three lines of uh, two or just two or three lines, and I can store all of them in a single uh, configuration file. So if you see some nginx configurations, you'll see there are like uh, there, there's like one whole file dedicated to a single website. <laughs> and so the next thing I want to recommend is a supervisor. So when you're running dynamic websites, you want a process that will keep running on your machine. Even if it gets killed by the OS, even if it uh, errors and then exits, you want it to restart by itself. Or even if the system reboots, you want the process to keep running. Uh, and that's why uh, you you use a process monitor, and supervisor is a very nice tool to do to do it. Uh, the way you write 
a supervisor configuration is uh, quite straightforward. This is the INI format, I think. And then, uh, so you start with uh, inside square brackets, you say program colon, the name of the program. So this program name is going to be the ID that you can use to get the logs and the status of the, uh, of the program from the command line. And then inside it, you say command equals uh, whatever the startup command is for this process. And then you can uh, give other, uh, other configuration uh, parameters such as directory, user, uh, directory is going to be the current working directory where, uh, where that process should start. User is the user, the Linux user that the process should run as. Environment is, a, are the, is the environment variables. And log file is the part to where you want to save the logs. Uh, the status QO thing for this is systemd, uh, whose parameters are very cryptic. Uh, these aren't, uh, systemd unit files aren't meant for uh, hosting web apps. They are meant for processes that start up when you, they start up when uh, your uh, computer starts up. And uh, while that is, while because of that it adds a lot of tricky parameters that you have to still configure, uh, your your configuration files also live with all of these other uh, init processes, uh, all of the all of the uh, unit files for these init processes. And it let's say you forget the name of name of uh, what you call the file, you'll have to search through the list, uh, search through a very big list and uh, find it. So I find this to be much simpler. There are a few other commands that you'll need to use to get started with running supervisor. Uh, but yeah, the main part is that the, it makes configuration simple. <laughs> now the next thing is rsync. And this is not an alternative to anything. This is, the, this is the command line tool you should use. Uh, it's, it's used to transfer files to and from local and remote devices. Uh, <coughs> the reason I'm including this is I learned about this quite late, uh, just sometime last year, and I wish I had known this before that. Uh, so before this, I used to, when I, whenever I had some local files and I had to transfer it to my self-hosted instance, I used to push them to git and then uh, pull it back, just like really stupid, or find some other hack. Uh, but this is just really straightforward. and. Uh, rsync is also incredibly flexible, so it has a lot of advanced options. For example, if you, uh, so, so this is the basic syntax, okay, let's start with the basic syntax. So you say rsync, the part to the local file or whatever the source is, and then the part to the destination. So if you want to, if you want the uh, source or the destination part to be remote, you give the SSH host name, whatever you use to SSH into it, the same host name you give here, uh, give a colon after that, and then a path, uh, and the path on the remote location after it. So this async command is moving the local file name, local file to the uh, to uh, to a file name remote location on myserver.example.com. Now it has a lot of advanced features, such as it can take a backup of your old directory, and uh, it can also uh, run a different command on the remote machine. So, for example, if I want to move my uh, directory to a protected directory, I can say uh, minus minus rsync path equals sudo rsync. So this will run sudo on the destination uh, destination machine so that there is no permissions issue. So minus r option here is to specify that this is to be recursive. So it will copy the contents recursively. And it also has support for dry runs, which will uh, tell you what changes will happen if, uh, if the async command was run. OK. Now, uh, the next thing I want to cover, this is like a technique. Uh, this is, this, but this is really cool, uh, which is using swap for extra memory. Um, so very often, you'll come across software that is RAM hungry but it doesn't consume as much CPU. So, uh, and you might, and a symptom of having such processes is 
you'll find that they are often killed due to the OOM out of memory error by the operating system. So in that case, what you can do is you can create swaps. So swap basically means that you are using some of your disk space as your extended RAM. Uh, so that way, if there are any processes that uh, need a lot of RAM, you you are covered. Uh, I ha I've had to use this a few times and it's been very handy. It really helps to maximize utilization. Uh, one thing you might want to notice, if you have your own hardware, uh, using swap a lot might not be a very good option because it might uh, uh, because it might damage whatever hard disk you are using uh, so but yeah if you are do, if you if you have a cloud instance it's not really your problem so uh, you can you can have very uh, you can have a large amounts of swap okay and uh, the last tool that i want to cover is uh, is Docker Compose. So if you are going to be hosting Docker containers on your machine, one thing you might, one tool you might benefit from using is Docker Compose. So uh, instead of running Docker containers with the Docker container run command, or uh, what you can instead do is specify all of those services as in a single Docker Compose.yaml file. And here, uh, one interesting and one interesting thing that you can do is uh, specify restart colon yaml. Uh, re sorry, restart colon always in the Docker Compose .yaml file. So what this will do is it will automatically take care of starting up uh, this process when it has failed or when it or when the system restarts. So remember when we talked about using supervisor to do the same thing. With Docker, you don't have to worry about it, and you can just say restart always in your Docker Compose. So, uh, yeah, those are my, uh, th yeah, that was the few tools that I do recommend using, and that's the end of the talk. I'm open for questions.